I'm Tatiana Antonelli, and you're listening to Forward Talks by Groombook, a podcast about moving towards sustainability in our region and beyond. A quick thanks to our partners at Our Space, the first co-working community designed to connect humans with nature. You can find out more at ourspace.work. One of the interesting results of doing this show and connecting with such amazing people is that we have a lot of you reaching out to us, suggesting guests, or because you yourselves have something to say. We love it and hope you guys continue to do that. This is also how we met our guest today. My name is Huda Shaka. I'm a um, associate director with Arab and the city's planning and design team. Huda is a scientist and an urban planner. She returned to Dubai after university in 2007 with a degree in chemistry, public health and atmospheric sciences. And as someone who grew up in Dubai, watching how the city had grown, she had quite a few natural questions about how the underlying infrastructure and natural resources had been planned out. What I didn't understand was, um, you know, where does all the water come from? Where does it go? Where does the energy come from? Where does it go? How much waste is produced? Those kind of big questions, um, which there wasn't really any data on, or at least any published data on how the system all worked together for Dubai as a city, for the UAE as a country, for the region, different cities around the region. Um, and so kind of partly doing um, reading, partly talking to people, let's start to piece the whole thing together. Um, and then the question is, okay, well, we want to develop a, whether it's a sustainable neighborhood, building, airport, whatever it is, you know, you can add the, the adjective green or sustainable to it. What does that really mean? And so... Um, for the first few years of my consultancy staff, my role was to essentially interpret the global best practices and principles, sustainability principles, to the local environment, the local needs, the local policies, still kind of um, you know, setting an ambitious target, but making it relevant. I was part of the team who looked at updating the Abu Dhabi Plan Capital 2030 for Abu Dhabi City, and that really opened my eyes to towards kind of city planning and, and working at that really super strategic um, level. And I decided to, after that project to take a year off and do a master's degree in um, urban planning. Um, came back and I uh, was lucky enough to work on the Sharjah strategic plan 2040 um, a few months after I got back and we're still working on that project and most of the work we do now or I do now is at that city scale um, sometimes at a master plan scale but it's looking at what does sustainability what does resilience what does environmental um, green mean at those different scales in this context. I can see when you speak that you're very passionate about the company where you work and before offline and I asked you uh, are you here, you know, to talk about your expertise or are you here to represent Arab? And uh, you said something really nice. <laughs> um, I'm here because I thought, uh, well, I, I really like the idea of the podcast and I thought, well, maybe people would like to hear the, the story I have to share. I don't see the difference really between here be, being um, representing myself, representing Arab. I'm doing something I'm interested in that obviously I work for Arab and it relates to the work I do, but also relates to what I'm passionate about. Um, and, uh, and, you know, at Arab there, we're encouraged to do what's, what's best for us as employees and the idea is that will be better for the company anyway. So there isn't really that difference. How was your experience to be part of the team who made it possible to have Dubai uh, hosting the next Expo 2020? So although I was um, born and raised in Dubai and, and based in Dubai pretty much all of my working life, a lot of the project work I, or a lot of the work I do is actually outside of Dubai. So Dubai Expo was one of the fir my first Dubai projects, it being able to kind of um, help put Dubai on the map, give back to the city, work with government agencies from around the city. Because putting on a, a major event like this is not about um, one company or one uh, government agency. It really does take the whole city to come and collaborate together, um, millions of visitors, et cetera, et cetera. How is the city going to function over six months? Um, so being able to... Um, think about sustainability strategically for the whole city, very forward thinking. We were worked in 2011, 2012, thinking about 2020, um, working with the various government agencies, putting Dubai, helping put Dubai on the international stage was really fulfilling. So at that time, you said everything started in 2011. So what was sustainability for Dubai at that time? How was it to measure Dubai compared to all the other bidding cities? 
What is, if you look at the site, first of all, the Expo 2020 site, the biggest question around major events, whether it's an Olympics or a World Cup or an Expo, is what is the site, what's the legacy for the site? What is the site going to become after the event? How do we make sure that the event isn't a waste of resources? Um, and actually, Dubai did it the right way around. So there was a legacy plan before even the idea of an Expo happened. There was a plan for the site uh, before the financial crisis. And so the idea was, okay, the expo actually could fit in really well. It will help us get the site going. And then we know what we're going to do with the site afterwards. We can plan it very well. The, you know, the starting point of the event made a lot of sense because it's, a, it's an interim use for a site that already had a master plan. You didn't have to invent a need or a use for the site afterwards. It's probably one of the biggest sustainability questions uh, for a major event. Um, beyond that, Dubai had very ambitious policies. So... Um, uh, whether it's the you know Dubai plan, Sheikh Mohammed's vision for Dubai, um, looking into green buildings, what um, Diwa's ambitious plans, etc. So, you know, um, yes, uh, Dubai sits in the UAE, which is a, a country that's fueled by fossil fuels, but it's um, one, it's not dependent on income from fossil fuels. It's a diverse economy. And it's, it's continued to look at how to minimize its resources, how to diversify its economy. Um, there's a, an extensive TSC network, which is actually, which has been in Dubai for decades. Um, as very few other cities have that. So where water is treated and then um, sent around the city for irrigation. Something um, we might even take for granted, but actually it's um, more, more cities are starting to do now. Um, there is a kind of the stories around the protection of the, the desert, whether it's um, particular wildlife sanctuaries or um, awareness at the Ramsar site around the lagoon, etc. Um, but I think in, in, in the early, you know, 2011, 2012, it was more about the city recognizing its large footprint and actively working on changing it top down from ambitious policies. Um, I think now, if we were to put a bid in now, there are a lot more numbers on the reduced ecological footprint, the amount of renewable energy, um, the number of green buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So those numbers weren't there at the time because that transition had just begun, um, but the, the ambition was clear. So you can see already how the Expo has changed things and brought you know, action and implementation. It's probably part of the... Part of the change, uh, the, I think the change would have happened with or without Expo. It's probably the Expo's helped maybe um, Dubai gain profile, gain momentum. Um, you know, having the sustain sustainability as one of the three pillars um, you know, got people thinking, what does it mean in our context? Um, so it was part of it, but you know, there's a lot more to Dubai and sustainability than, than the Expo. But also the Expo would be a great way to exhibit and showcase the different solutions, alternatives from, from all over the world. Of course, not all of them will be able to be applied here, being this a very specific uh, ecosystem. And this is actually my next question, because I know that you're here today specifically also to talk about arid cities and arid regions and, and the future. And I'm really interested to know more because somehow the emergency we see for the future is definitely water. And so this is something that interests me particularly. Cities are library thinking, cities in arid environments is a, um, a thought piece we worked on as a, as a team, actually not just in the Dubai office, but as a global Arab team. So I started that with the idea that um, obviously we live and work in Dubai, in the UAE, in the GCC, which is an, an arid environment. And we wanted, we saw a lot of um, publications for Arab and you know, internationally, externally, best practices around you know, green roofs, um, green buildings, green facades. And it's the, the idea we had or the question we had was, that's great. How relevant is this if we wanted to apply it to cities in the UAE or the GCC? We realized that actually there are a lot of other cities in the world that have that are classified as arid and have similar challenges and are thinking about the same Idea. So when, if, you know, from Australia to the United States, going through China, obviously Africa and Asia. And so um, that's where we reached out to our Arab network, um, professionals and colleagues in these cities, as well as you know, contacts, people we know, mayors, government officials, etc., cetera, um, to help us collect um, best practices, case studies, 
questions, what are the unsolved you know, questions, what are people thinking about, what are they worried about around, um, around resilience, around the use of energy and water, around public spaces. Um, so it was uh, probably a year's, uh, a year's worth of talking, asking questions, writing, reviewing, talking again, etc. Uh, actually, what we, if you look at um, Dubai or Vegas or some of the other cities, how these cities tend um, tend to have really started off as as major cities is they in the kind of the mid um, 20th century there was the invention of air conditioning and suddenly it um, it was you know feasible to live in these cities year long larger population obviously people always lived in Dubai for many um, for many centuries but it's the bigger populations foreigners extra people coming from outside to live um, and then you had elevators so you could go you know. F- high density, um, cheap land without, there is no opportunity cost. So it's not agricultural land, it's not forest land, it's not hilly land, it's land available to build on. So the, almost the kind of the um, automatic response is build, sprawl, you have the space, there is no competing uses, you have AC, you have cars, you can get around very comfortably, so just kind of build out. And so what you end up is with this, um, really unsustainable model of cities uh, based on a largely North American, um, Western European model of city building that was initially there to help alleviate the problems of congested cities that were in kind of the late um, 18th, 19th century. We, didn't, we don't have that problem. We didn't start off with that problem, but we adopted the model that came as a solution mm-hmm. that actually created its own problems in our context. So that's why we kind of, it's about rethinking cities. So really um, considering what is, we have what we have, but there are obviously other cities in the world that are in arid environments that haven't quite developed to the level that Dubai has or other cities have. So whether it's an existing city or a new city, how do we best plan and design and build for this climate at a city level, at a neighborhood level, and at a building level? And that's what this um, piece tries to ask and partly answer, although there is, I think, a lot more answers to be found. Is this a report uh, dedicated specifically to retrofitting or really building new cities? Both. Because what I ask myself is, do we really need to continuously build. We've been told two years ago by different reports uh, from the United Nations that we won't be able to live here by 2050, that temperatures will rise up to 65 degrees uh, Celsius. So this, of course, is also due to all the CO2 emissions and, you know, fuel, fossil fuel, construction, waste... Do you think it's feasible to say no more, let's live in our existing cities, let's retrofit them, or should we then build new cities? But what are we going to do with the old ones? So in cities like Dubai, other cities in the GCC, that is a question. You have the option to continue building or not to. In other cities in Africa, for example, and if we, what we, we mapped was that cities with very high natural birth rates so expected very high population growth versus the climate. And you see that a lot of the cities that are expected to grow are in arid climates. You can say we won't build on those cities, but where will those people live? There are cities that are ex- expecting millions more people just from natural birth and natural growth. So how will those cities be, be planned? Yeah, it's very tricky because somehow, and we recently celebrated uh, the International Refugee Day, And when we talk about refugees, we specifically talk about wars and and terrible events that ask people to move away from their countries. But we also should talk about climate change refugees and entire villages moving away from their homes because there's no way they can survive. There's no food, there's no water. Shouldn't we think already now about where we're going to receive populations to make sure they're happy and they thrive instead of having to deal with the problem we find a solution now? Where would you build now? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think with these questions, so one, the, 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 none of the work we do gets to that level of kind of um, uh, ethical and political kind of uh, God questions, if you want. So like, where would you put a million people? So it's, it's more about, I think these things kind of, um, you can influence them, but people will um, move to particular cities where the closest to them, what the, the most convenient to them. So I think what we what we're trying to say is where we know, where we expect, where kind of cities exist that we expect will 
grow um, rapidly, here is what they should be thinking about. The question of aridity, so yes, water resources might be scarce, but uh, we have a few topic um, pages on water. And what it talks about is the innovative ways of water supply. So water from dew, for example, um, but also how you can then reuse the water. So look at the whole water cycle. So uh, use less, use more efficiently, use from alternative sources. Um, so I don't, nowhere have we really come to the point where we, we felt it was important to say, actually, you should reconsider where those people are to begin with. Um, it's probably thinking about how, you know, wherever people end up in, how do we make their their lives better just by how we plan the space. Uh, and that, that's kind of the angle the book is, um, the publication is taking. Cities like in, in the GCC, that's, a, that's almost a different question because the population is largely transient, it's largely coming from somewhere else. Um, and, then, and then you're absolutely right, the question here is how many of the buildings we see around today will last, can last? Uh, and it's a very different, it's a very different mindset, um, building for for long term versus building for short term. Um, and at the moment, a lot of what we're seeing is kind of building for the short term. I know you've also released uh, different reports, for example, um, the activity of children in cities, uh, how they interact, how we plan our cities, um, public spaces. How do you see Dubai, for example? Um, can are they working on it? Because I've seen a lot happening. There's a lot more of cycling paths, for example. They're actually crossing the city. Can we grow this in Dubai? All the new developments that are coming up, and there are a lot. Um, they are now not on the seaside. They're more internally towards the desert. What's happening there? So that's a really good question. And a lot of the work we've now been doing is on that as public spaces, public realm. So 2007, 2008, up to kind of the... To intent. Uh, green buildings was a new thing and people were still figuring out what does a green building mean in the context of Dubai or the UAE. I think we've, for the most part, got buildings figured out. I'm not saying it's necessarily easy. The challenge is the next scale. So looking at the, the neighborhood level or the city level from a spaces perspective, public realm, what's the appropriate amount, type, size, function of, um, of a park or a square? In a city like Dubai, for example, um, how can it cater to the children year long? How can it cater to various members of the public? What's the, you know, is it public? Is it completely public? Is it completely private? Can it be private but have a public amenity? Um, so yes, there's a lot, a lot more is happening and a lot more can happen. Um, you know, you'll see. So the first, I think, experiment at, um, giving people access to quality public realm was, uh, I would say, the beach at JBR. And we were involved on, on that project from a transport perspective. But it's um, it takes one brave developer or project proponent to try something, and then people kind of are convinced that it works and everybody wants it. So um, the, the beach worked fantastic. People actually went there, still go there even in the summer. But it's a, it's a successful place. It attracts people. They enjoy, you know, you have the coast, you have the sea, you have the activities, etc. And then after that, you had City Walk and the mayor, etc., etc. So this is all kind of, you'll see people now um, getting out of the mall and actually going and enjoying themselves outdoors. So that's kind of step number one. Now, obviously, these spaces you still have to drive and get to. So you can't just, you know, walk there. Um, it's also, they're also kind of a particular type of food and beverage. They cater to a particular type of uh, people, probably. So it's then, okay, what's the next level? How can you make these spaces more accessible, um, cater to a more diverse range of people, um, similar with the parks? So is it is it really just about having the big green parks? My, you know, I keep telling people this, I don't think Central Park can work in Dubai as it works in Manhattan because these big green spaces need a lot of irrigation. They're not comfortable most of the year because they're largely unshaded. What I think this part of the world needs more is the smaller public parks, smaller community parks. So it's a hierarchy. Just like you don't have, you know, only universities, you have kindergartens and primary schools and then universities. It's not about just having, you know, it's not just a simple indicator as saying the percentage of green space. So where are the parks? How big are they? What function do they have? Can you get to them? Do they cater for all the population? And that's what I think we need to get a bit more sophisticated in our planning is look at public space um, in that way as a facility that has, you know, there's a hierarchy to it. It has to cater to all the people in the city at different levels. 
So as you might know through Gumbuk and the Give a Gap Tree Planting Program, we've been trying to raise awareness about the UAE, uh, the local environment, the fact that we live in, in a desert. Many people think this is just a desert and we try to make them understand it is a living desert full of life with over 400 species of, of animals and insects and birds and, and many, many hundreds of species of flowers and plants and trees. Have you seen... Uh, an interest in developers in the government to really change people's mindset when they build new developer developments, when they build new cities to really stop using high intensity um, species rather than local indigenous trees. Yeah, so we can talk about this topic for five hours, I think. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's many angles to it. There's an interesting book that came out recently called Paradoxes of Green. So it's an anthropologist based in Bahrain looking at how people um, interpret, understand, relate to value different shades of green. And so it's actually quite insightful. It's done from somebody who's completely foreigner, foreigner to the region. Um, but it, I think it, it um, highlights a lot of subtleties in the culture and what, how, what people value in green. And the point he makes, which I really like, is... Uh, lots of places around the world, um, green is rural, gray, concrete, yellow is urban, right? The urban is steel, concrete city, the rural is green, um, forestry, etc. Not so in the, in the, in the Gulf. So in, in the Gulf cities, um, the urban that developed is green. Nice. The rural is desert. And so green brings this, um, uh, this sense of development and kind of modernity and moving forward and richness to it. And it's what what type of green? Because there is, you know, in Bahrain you have the older date palms, which are a particular shade of green, and the newer date palms that are brought to landscape the streets and the palaces, which are a different, brighter shade of green. And which, which shade of green do people defer and what kind of value they attach to each? So there, it's quite deep, actually, um, the culture, cultural roots that you know, kind of relate to the sense of green and what does it mean to people and how they value it. So I guess that's the starting point. To, to address your question, um, so we are seeing definitely more examples of uh, kind of zeriscaped landscapes. So, you know, 10 years ago, you, you know, started talking about, okay, zeriscaping, low water, it was in every sustainability strategy or plan or guideline, you will see kind of low water vegetation, low water green landscape, etc. It's only kind of more recently that people actually trying it it's probably the push is going probably more from the government side that's the private developers because at the moment there really isn't the incentive to 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 go zero escapes what if my colleagues will say i you know don't plant grass where you wouldn't let your child run around so what's the point of having lots of water thirsty grass in the medians of streets where nobody can really interact with it or play with it if you're really going to have grass we're not saying no grass at all but have it in the park have it in a place where people can actually use it so yeah so why do we need um palm trees and medians of streets you know they're not pro really providing food they're not providing shade yes they're they're beautiful and maybe in the one promenade in the city which has to be like this really grand promenade maybe there to give it a bit of unique identity but why do we have to have it on all the streets um you know you could talk about forests in the desert you can talk about uh, golf courses etc so there there is a there is a culture shift that needs to happen there's a policy shift that needs to happen there's a behavior change that you know accompanies all of that that is probably just starting there's a there's a long way to go Thanks so much to Huda for reaching out and joining us on this episode. You'll find a link to an e-version of the book Cities Alive, Rethinking Cities in Arid Environments, published by Arup in our show notes. If you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe in our favorite podcast player and find us on the web at homebook.com. We'll be back with a new episode next week. See you then.